As you listen to the word of the Lord, open your heart to it because the word of God carried power. The word of the Lord is coming from the mouth of his servant. Listen and be blessed. Amen. A spiritual journey because I believe that tonight is a very defining moment for someone here seated and the many who are following by way of television, following by way of the internet. Hallelujah. I want to describe for you three strategic phases in a believer's life, the believer's journey, so that you can identify tonight which of the phases that you are in and then to know how to release your faith to maximize that which God is doing, especially in this season. It is important for us to be discerning enough to know and to understand what God is doing per time, per season. There has been a global advocacy of the move of God, revivals upon our nation, Nigeria, Africa, and across the globe. And that is correct, except that if we do not understand the progression of the believer's journey, as far as your walking with God is concerned, you may abort destiny not knowing. Hallelujah. Please pay attention. Now, please look up. Many of you have wondered why it seems as though God uses certain people in very mighty and significant ways. It looks like in every generation, there seem to be a few people who are mightily used by God. Not just in ministry as we know, but in business, in government. And then it looks like a majority of others just crouch around the corridors of destiny, not knowing what to do with their lives. And yet the Bible very clearly tells us that in Christ we have been predestined. Everybody has a destiny in Christ. Hallelujah. Now please listen very carefully. The believer's journey, in fact, for you to be a believer, the foundation of your walk with God is your encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Please listen very carefully. As simple as this sounds, you will be surprised how many people have been around spiritual things, around church, respectfully speaking, perhaps they have risen to the position of leadership at different levels, but they have never truly encountered the Lord Jesus. They have encountered a man of God. They have encountered um, doctrine, profitable. They have encountered good people. They have served diligently, but they have not encountered the Lord Jesus. The greatest need of an unbeliever, that means one who has not received Jesus, the greatest need of an unbeliever is not counseling. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not healing. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not deliverance. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not prosperity. These things are all wonderful. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not education. The greatest need of an unbeliever is none of these things. According to divine priority, the greatest need of an unbeliever, listen carefully, is not even an encounter with angels. It's not even the gifts of the Spirit. No. In order of priority, for your spiritual journey to be correct and profitable, the starting point of everyone's spiritual journey, provided it is Christ and His purposes that you desire to see established in your life, the greatest need of an unbeliever is an encounter with Jesus, the Son of the Living God. Please write it down. It is important that the Jesus you are describing is the Son of the Living God. There can be Jesus as the name of someone. I, I understand there's a footballer that has such a name, and there are many other people across the globe that have that name. So that we are not confused. The Jesus we are talking about 
is Jesus the son of the living God. I don't care what you know, respectfully speaking. I don't care how long you have served. I don't care how morally excellent you are. I don't care how excellent of a commu or communicator or whatever it is that you have that represents an advantage in your life. Spiritually speaking, you have not begun the believer's journey except and unless you encounter Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But apostle, I saw an angel. An angel is not Jesus. But apostle, I went to heaven as profitable as it is. Going to heaven in a visionary encounter does not automatically translate to salvation. Listen, if we do not culture believers and the body of Christ to understand the correct ordinances of the believer's journey, we are going to have so many people around the corridors of spirituality without a genuine identification. When we started with Christ, when we started in the faith, I remember the old folks would come and say, have you received Jesus as your personal? That word personal, not corporate, not we worshipped and the presence of God came down. That is not salvation. I can tell you that many people have not encountered Jesus, the son of the living God, by making a definite, intentional, conscious declaration acknowledging his substitutionary sacrifice and the fact that he is Lord, he is Savior and King. If you are with me, say amen. amen. The Bible has a few things to say about Jesus. Number one, it says, For God so loved the world, John three sixteen, that he gave his then now only begotten Son, Today we will not say he is his only begotten son. Today we will call him the firstborn among we the begotten. Are we together? So he says that whosoever believes in him, he should not perish, but have life everlasting or life eternal. Then he says God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Apostle Paul in mentoring the church in Rome gave us the biblical pattern and the biblical salvation, uh, the biblical pathway for receiving salvation. In Romans chapter 10, please, from verse 8 to 10. Romans chapter 10, from verse 8 to 10. I'll quote for the sake of time. It says that the word is nigh thee. Are we still together? In your mouth. And in your heart. Someone say in your mouth. Please shout it. Say in your mouth. Say in your heart. Your mouth and your heart must play an active role. Otherwise salvation cannot be ministered to you. Wishing to be saved does not get you saved. Hoping to be saved does not get you saved. Planning to be saved does not get you saved. Crying to be saved does not get you saved. The Bible says the heart and the mouth are the two principal tools as far as the administration of the life of God is concerned. Verse 9 says, verse 9, please give it to us. It says, if thou shalt confess with your mouth, not with your mind, with your mouth, the Lordship of Jesus believing in your heart that god raised him from the dead it leaves you with a promise it says thou shall be saved verse 10 says for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and then it says with the mouth confession is made unto salvation ladies and gentlemen please hear me if at any point in your journey your christian journey you cannot remember intentionally, consciously, and willfully believing in your heart that Jesus came to the earth. He died, resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit to purchase redemption and salvation for you. And that you have not verbalized it consciously. 
I hate to be a bearer of bad news. But I have to tell you by the integrity of scripture tonight. That as far as heaven is concerned. You are not saved. It's as simple and as honest as that. And let me encourage fellow servants of God and co-laborers in the gospel. It is important that we do not get too advanced to a point where we see as basic elementary or primary the fact that members and people around us need to be saved. Sometimes in a bid to pursue heights and depths in the spirit and that is wonderful and profitable. We ignore what we believe to be elementary the subject of salvation and we do so to our detriment. So we have many people who are sound in Greek and Hebrew. We have many people preaching even in conferences. We have many people who are sound as far as the understanding of the doctrine of scripture is concerned. Except that that is just a theoretical head knowledge like academics. As far as the realm of the spirit is concerned, that work of regeneration that comes by acknowledging Jesus has not happened. Which is why it is possible that you can see very intelligent, very spiritually sound persons, but you do not find the character and the fruit that befits a genuine encounter with Jesus. Because intellectual prowess is not equal to salvation. Is someone learning now? So this is the first phase and the first juncture as far as the believer's journey is concerned. The foundation that means if you ever find anybody who says, I want to walk with God, I want to live a purposeful life, I want to live a meaningful life, the first part of call, you can tell him, go to church. You can tell him, meet a man of God. You can tell him, come for a wonderful crusade like this. But all of these are only a means to an end. The end being Jesus. Jesus had this to say about himself. He said, I am the way. Do you believe that? He said, I am the truth. And he says, I am the life. That no man comes to the Father except through me. In fact, the Bible says there is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. The name of Joshua Selman cannot save you. Even though you love the name, it has no power in itself to administer salvation. Have you met Jesus? Don't tell me I've been in church for 10 years. I congratulate you for your consistency. But as far as the realm of the spirit is concerned, the scribes and the Pharisees were already around the things of God. They were masters of doctrine, masters of the law. Yet Jesus looked at them and said, Ye err not knowing the scriptures. He said, The scripture testify of me. Longevity around spiritual activities, as profitable as it is, does not automatically bring salvation. That is point one. Is someone following now? So the greatest need of an unbeliever, please learn this as a rule of thumb, that every time you see a man who does not know Jesus, more than the welfare that you give him, more than the invitation to church, the greatest cry of heaven over that individual is his salvation not just his children not his academic pursuit alone all those things are wonderful but the highest spiritual priority the point of focus for any unbeliever is that he comes to know jesus now the second phase of that journey are we still together i presume that many of us here by the grace of god and based on the integrity of scripture can boldly say that we are saved that we have acknowledged the lordship of jesus and to those many i congratulate you for making the noblest decision that any man can make as far as this side of god's kingdom is concerned but it does not stop there this is where i want you to pay attention now because many believers who now come to christ do not know what else to do with their lives please pay attention some of you may be victims of this now. It is true that you are saved, but you probably were not guided to know what else to do. As far as your journey 
in the pursuit of God's spirituality, purpose, and destiny is concerned. What do I do now that I've encountered Jesus? Many years ago, attending the crusade of the great Reinhard Bonke, they used to have a, a, a leaflet, a little book called Now That You Are Saved. It was an attempt to provide guidance that from the point of salvation, that is only the beginning of the journey. It does not stop there. Unfortunately, there are many believers who camp around the gate of the kingdom. You are saved, genuinely so, congratulations. But they are never able to live effective lives. They have dreams of being prophets, apostles, teachers, evangelists, businessmen, captains of industry, great men and women who have mighty and marvelous prophetic destinies. But many die without actualizing that destiny because they do not know that there is still a step after salvation. Salvation is priority and it is the first step, but not the only step. Is someone learning now? The second phase of the believer's journey, if you're writing, please write, is called the phase of transformation and renewal. So the first is an encounter with, the, with um, Jesus, the Son of the living God, that translates to your new birth experience like we call it. The second phase is renewal and transformation. Someone shout renewal. Say transformation. One more time. Say renewal. Say transformation. Because you see, according to scripture, the character of the new birth experience is that it primarily affects your spirit first. It is a spirit to spirit encounter. But as you know, man is tripartite. A spirit that lives in a body having a soul, the faculties of the mind, the will, emotion, and intellect. And all these have roles to play as far as your growing in God is concerned and actualizing destiny. So it is possible that your spirit is saved, but that your mind is not yet transformed. And it can abort the potential of that which you have received in your spirit through the new birth. Are we together now? In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18, the Bible says, Having their understanding darkened, Ephesians 4, 18, it says, Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their minds. So when your mind is unfruitful, you are not able to be a useful vessel in the hands of God. When you get to the realm of renewal and transformation, listen carefully. There are three principal forces that must be released in your life for that phase of your life to be profitable. Number one is the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Please write it down. While it is true that the Holy Spirit plays an active role in the administration of salvation, there is the office of the Holy Spirit and the function that he plays in the life of the now believer in Christ. Are we learning now? If you are with me, shout Amen. amen. Let the devil hear you shouting amen. amen. So I said that the first phase in the believer's journey is your encounter with Jesus, the Son of the living God. Then you get to the phase of renewal and transformation. And this is a long period in the believer's life. Determined by your zeal. Not just the grace of God. The, the same Lord is rich unto all. It is at this phase that many believers separate themselves. Into various levels of spiritual possibilities. The same salvation is administered at the point of confession. But now, the journey of renewal and transformation, you are introduced to the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I wish I had time to teach on the Holy Spirit. I can spend an entire week and even year teaching you about the Holy Spirit. But a few things for you to know about the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit is God, not an archangel, not one of the spirit beings, not one of the doves or candles, 
like the bible shows us in types and shadows the holy spirit is god number two the holy spirit is the creative dimension of the godhead that means the manifestation of power resides within the office of the holy spirit the holy spirit is also the manifestation of the presence of jesus to the believer today that every time you call on jesus the person jesus is seated at the right hand of the father today the bible tells us but the personality who represents his presence every time you call jesus is the spirit of the living god he's the holy ghost spirit of the living god you're the holy ghost scepter of the king of kings you're the holy ghost seal of the age to come you're changing everything in obedience to Christ. So the Holy Spirit has an assignment. The first assignment of the Holy Spirit to the believer, listen carefully, is to activate your organs of interaction with the realm of the Spirit. Because the Bible says that natural man cannot receive the things of God. Neither can they profit him because they are spiritually discerned spiritual things cannot make sense to you except and unless you are open to the ministry of the holy spirit are we together now that is the reason why some of you are now active practitioners of the things you once laughed at for instance the prayer language of the spirit before you got born again and before you were open to his ministry it sounded like gibberish now you are an active uh, a, a prayer person especially in the spirit because the holy spirit has quickened the bible calls it quickening then the holy spirit is responsible for revelation and understanding very very powerful paul praying over the church in ephesus you find that in ephesians chapter 1 beginning from verse 17 down to 20 paul was praying over the church in ephesus and he prayed that they be filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of their understanding be flooded with lights that they may know comprehend the hope of the calling that they now were in very very important without the holy spirit the bible will only be a book of history a book of literature it takes the holy spirit to open the mysteries and the riches that are hidden in scripture listen the bible was not supposed to be just read philosophically or intellectually academically in as much as the bible is a book of literature the bible is a book of archaeology the bible is a book of history you find the, all the aforementioned in scripture. But there is a spiritual component to the Bible that only the Holy Spirit, my goodness, who is God speaking to tonight? An attempt to study scripture without submitting to the ministry of the Holy Spirit will only frustrate you. For such people, the Bible says, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth because they do not have revelation remember the utopian enoch he was reading the scripture while he was on his way to jerusalem but he did not have understanding and the holy ghost had to speak to philip to join this chariot and then the man said of whom this man spake of himself or another it takes the holy spirit for you to have understanding in isaiah 11 the Bible talks of that stem from the root of Jesse. And it talks about the sevenfold dimension of the spirit. The spirit of the Lord, dominion. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. It talks of the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And then it says, it shall make you of quick understanding. Are we still together? Your spirit opens to me the treasures of your word. 
I will forever sing your praise. It's your spirit that opens to me the treasures of your word. And I will forever sing your praise. I will sing of the wonders of your word. I will sing out for joy I will see of the wonders of your word and I will forever sing your praise listen to me ladies and gentlemen there is no great man that you know today in this nation and across the globe including our father in the Lord that is you you see that the mysteries that they have access to is credited to their submission to the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There are many of you here who have had visions of mighty, mighty things that God will be doing in and through your life and yet you have ignored the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There is no possibility of becoming if you ignore Him. The Holy Spirit is beyond a Pentecostal phenomenon. The Holy Spirit is beyond a charismatic phenomenon. Jesus gave the Holy Spirit as a gift to the church. The guarantee that we will become. Is someone hearing now? This is important. For someone God is speaking to you. It's important to embrace the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad I did. Look what he's made out of my life. The Holy Spirit, listen, can turn darkness to chaos. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, when there was darkness and chaos, it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then it says now the earth was dark and void and formless. From the Hebrew word tohu wa bohu, confusion and chaos. And then it says, but the spirit hovered round the face. Every time there is darkness and void, a life with no color, a life with no beauty, no dignity, doesn't matter how it happened to your grandfather, to your father, you submit to the Holy Spirit and see what he's able to do. He is brooding over every darkness. He is causing lights to shine from darkness the holy ghost is brooding over every darkness he's causing lights to shine so are we still together now we're dealing with the phase of renewal and transformation and i'm introducing to you the person of the holy spirit and that the Holy Spirit quickens your spirit man and your organs to help you comprehend spiritual things. Now you will see value in fasting. Now you will see value in prayer. Now you will see value in going to church because your spirit man has been quickened. Attempting to force religious activities on people without the Holy Spirit sponsoring the quickening will only lead to a burdensome ritual. It is the Holy Spirit that plants passion within your heart. So that you will do things that seem to be laborious but with joy. Because your spirit man has been quickened. Is someone hearing now? So the Holy Spirit activates your organs of interaction with the Spirit. Being alive unto God. The Holy Spirit is responsible for revelation and understanding very very important hear me please it is at this point of renewal and transformation that you now begin to learn the ways of god the holy spirit introduces the word of god to you now the word of god can be valuable to you listen the ministry of the spirit and the ministry of the word are the two principal forces that sponsor transformation and renewal there is no superstition to transformation and renewal it is your ability to immerse yourself 
in fellowship with the Spirit and to be studious of Scripture. It says, and that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture, it says, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. It says, and now brethren, Acts 20, 32. And now brethren, I commend you to God, it says, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. It is the word of God that builds. The word of God helps you to understand the modus operandi of the kingdom. Now you know how the kingdom operates. You begin to learn what the Bible calls the ways of God. And you see according to scripture, the ways of God precede the glory of God. You cannot see the glory of God until you understand his ways. Moses said, show me your ways. Then he said, show me your glory. Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 6. The Lord commanded Moses. He said, this is the thing that the Lord commanded that you should do. And then the glory shall appear unto you. There is something you need to know. And then it empowers you to do. And then the glory comes. In Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32, the people says, But the people that do know their God, they shall be strong, capacity, and they shall do exploits. It takes knowledge, then becoming, then doing. You shall know, then you shall be, then you shall do. You cannot do without knowing. You cannot do without being. Are we together now? Yes. You now begin to know what the Bible calls the truth. And the Bible says with the truth comes liberty. You will know that you know the truth because you will begin to experience liberty across various aspects of your life. You now begin to learn scripture that there is he that scattereth and yet tends to penury. But there is he that uh, scattereth and yet increaseth. There is he that withholdeth more than his meat and tends to poverty. You are understanding the economic system of the kingdom now. You are understanding the value of prayer. The Bible says, for instance, in John, in uh, Mark 11 and verse 24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray. That means your desire remains unfruitful until you mix it with prayer. That automatically activates your prayer life because the word of God has given you spiritual illumination. Luke 18 and verse 1, he spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. First Thessalonians 5 17, he says to pray without ceasing. Are we together? Now you start engaging fellowship and prayer with the spirit and the ministry of the word i give you a guarantee as you begin to submit to the spirit submit to the ministry of prayer submit to the ministry of the word and evolving begins to happen in your spirit the weak you starts becoming the strong you the timid you starts becoming the powerful you the foolish you starts becoming the wise you because the word of god is a compendium of the wisdom of god is someone learning so if your spiritual experience is unprofitable by this journey god is showing everyone where you stand there are those who are not even saved in the first place in the moment i'm going to be making an altar call and giving you a chance to make it right with jesus but for the many who are saved and yet your life is not fruitful and not profitable i am showing you what is missing you have ignored the ministry of the holy spirit alongside the fortitude for prayer that comes as a result of fellowship with him the primary assignment of prayer is not to get things the primary assignment of prayer is as a tool for growth and transformation luke chapter 9 and verse 29 it says and as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment became white and glistering Is God speaking to us? Yes. All men ought to pray, not as a burdensome ritual, not as pretense to show spirituality. It is part of the spiritual growth protocol that helps men. So every day you are praying. 
30 minutes, one hour, two hours, three hours, as God grants you grace, then submitting to the ministry of the word, something begins to happen to you. Listen very carefully. I can assure you, submit yourself to the ministry of the word. Submit yourself to fellowship with the spirit. Submit yourself to the ministry of prayer. And something begins to happen to you. Illumination comes to your mind. Spiritual understanding comes to you. Ah. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord, like a candle. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord, like menorah. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord, like a candle. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Like a candle, lights me low. Listen, can I tell you one of the ways that you measure your growth and maturity in the spirit? Listen very carefully, is to begin to measure your speakings. The Bible says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. Is that true? I understood like a child. I thought like a child. That means the word of God affects these various faculties of your life. Your thinking your understanding and your speaking now let me get to phase three very quickly is god speaking to someone i hope you've not forgotten what we are dealing with three phases in that believer's journey the first phase is the starting point an encounter with jesus jesus says i am the door not one of the doors the only door the way in fact now you get to the second phase major phase renewal and transformation that's by the ministry of the holy spirit that's by the ministry of consistent prayer that by the ministry of the study of the word of god among the many things that happen in this phase too is a revelation you see the more you know god the more you understand yourself the bible says as we behold him as in a mirror he says we are changed you will become like what you are seeing it is at this phase that the revelation of purpose and destiny comes to you he says lo i come in the volume of the book as it is written of me to do your will by the time you find god god will now begin to show you the blueprint of your destiny you will find yourself gravitating along the areas of your destiny some of you may be five friends praying together studying together you will find one of them begin to diverge to the ministry of the prophetic unusual passion for prayer and fasting the holy ghost is doing a work in that man now he's beginning to he may not even know us at that time that that is what god is doing because you see when you meet god he does not reveal destiny he reveals himself it is when you find him first that destiny becomes profitable when jesus met the disciples he said follow me not follow it no you don't follow it when you come you follow him in following him you will find it whatever that it is follow me and i will make you it is only him that can make remember he's the maker of the heavens and the earth but it is not only the heavens and the earth he makes he makes men too purpose and destiny now you begin to know that this is what god has called you into out of the abundance of the vast encounters out of the abundance of a life dedicated to learning to doctrine to prayer to fellowship with the spirit it is impossible ladies and gentlemen to maximize this phase of your life and not have a rich robust profitable stature in the spirit it is the absence of this that is responsible for weak believers ignorant believers and believers who are not profitable as far as kingdom come is concerned now watch this let me go to the third phase for the sake of our discussion tonight the third phase is the phase of empowerment and release empowerment and release 
Release there does not mean leaving you. Empowerment and now releasing you to be a witness. Listen. Never stand before Pharaoh when you have not stood before God. It is a risk to stand before Pharaoh until you know the God who has sent you. When he called Moses, Moses said, don't send me to Pharaoh. That man is a wizard. And it takes more than English or Hebrews for him to deliver the people. I have the destiny of a deliverer, but who shall I tell Moses has sent me? Many of you were called, but you are not yet sent and you started going. The fact that God called you does not mean he has sent you. He called you to himself. He sends you to the world. Let me repeat. He calls you to himself. He sends you to the world. I can call you. Let me use a gentleman here. Come sir. Watch this. Have I called him? Has he answered the call? I called him to myself. Now go back. Who sent you? I don't doubt your call. But I doubt your witness. Because when he calls you, he makes you, he empowers you, then he sends you. God called me is not enough to be effective. God calls you to fellowship with Jesus. God calls you to fellowship with the word. God calls you to fellowship with the spirit. Then he sends you. He said, when I sent thee, lackest thou anything? When I sent you, not when you went. Is someone learning now? So the face of empowerment. This is where the Holy Ghost introduces you to the mystery of the anointing. My head, you have exalted like the horn of a unicorn. And I am anointed with fresh oil my head you have exalted like the horn of a unicorn and i am anointed with fresh oil hear me there are levels in the spirit where you collide with the power of the highest in luke chapter 1 from verse 35 when the angel brought glad tidings to Mary, Mary asked a question. Verse 34. How shall these things be? Seeing that I know not a man. Joshua Selman, how can God use me to build a global ministry? Seeing that I came from a village somewhere in Port Harcourt. Is it really true that one day I will be a mother to nations? Is it really true that one day I will be an apostle to the nations? Is it really true that one day I will take the baton of the fathers who have joined the cloud of witnesses? Mary asks a question. How shall it be like God has told you many great things and little you is sitting there wondering, can God really make something out of my life? The answer is found in verse 35. And the angel replied, Mary, Luke 1, 35. The Holy Ghost will come upon you and the power of the highest. Don't ask how you will go to the nations. Don't ask how you will go to Europe, America. Help them please. The power of the highest is the mystery behind the exploits of men in this kingdom. It takes more than intellect and human connection. Hear me. It takes the Holy Ghost to make a generation hear you. It takes the power of God that mantles your life. It takes the power of God for the sick to be healed. It takes the power of God for the oppressed to be a pakatosh kadibata. It takes the power of God. Hear me. No matter how transformed you are, Without empowerment, you will only be a frustrated, knowledgeable believer. It's important to know what you must receive the engracing 
to defend what you know. There are many believers who can talk spiritual talk. I know my God. He's a lion of the tribe of Judah. He can lift. He can bless and we clap. Then when it is time to prove the reality of the power of God. Maybe God is speaking to a man of God. You have done well in the area of transformation. But this is the missing link to your ministry. To the point where if you say God bless you. People cannot say amen again. Because they are so used to the powerlessness of your speakings. Hear me. I understand our Father in the Lord. That the Jew is going to be graciously visiting Port Harcourt. I think in a matter of days or so. A week or a little over a week. Such an honor and a privilege for your soul to be able to host this general, global general, again, a father of fathers indeed. Now, please listen. Baba can stand here and say, God bless you. And as simple and quiet as it is, the testimonies that follow, as at the time he's saying it, there are people who have no business rising to certain levels. But the kind of energy that has been generated through decades of interaction with the Spirit, that is the energy that is released. I flew here from Abuja and every time I fly, it's a lesson to me about what power can do. The same plane that is going to be flying 35,000 feet above sea level, it starts very slow. Sometimes you would think the plane is too big to fly. As it's moving, you will think all of the, the pressure, gravity, the force can stand it. But you see, when it starts at the runway, it begins to run. It gets to a speed where it becomes unfair for the plane to remain on the ground. Th there, is, there is a level of speed that when that aircraft gets to, it will lift within a moment and in less than a minute. It's in the air. For someone, you are saying, Apostle, I've been walking slow. There is the energy of the Spirit coming on you. A time will come in your life. You will run like Elijah. Then you will fly like the eagle. Help them, please. Please hear me. In this sermon tonight, I just described for you my spiritual journey with God authentic power is beyond impartation it will take a track record of properly following these faces many people keep receiving hands laid on them with an empty mind the absence of a track record with the holy spirit the ministry of prayer and the word that's why the impartation does not serve the value of impartation is that it comes upon a knowledgeable vessel Are we together? The spirit of living God. When that power from on high comes upon you, ladies and gentlemen, it is able to turn Saul into Paul. Ah, it is able to turn Sarai into Sarah. Tonight, the Lord has sent me here to give us an opportunity to experience all three phases. For someone, the first phase is your desperate need. You were invited for this crusade probably. Thank you for coming. For someone, what you need is the grace and the energy to step into a season of radical transformation and renewal. Some of you who are already prematurely exposed in ministry may need to take a little break and say this shame and reproach that I keep bringing on the altar I am tired of it I need to return back and file myself not from a competitive standpoint but so that I can become a battle axe that cuts indeed then the final phase I believe there are many people here who are sincerely saying apostle I, with all humility I can say that I've submitted myself to doctrine and learning but the power of God seems to be absent from my life, my family, my ministry and my business 
Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, you cannot accomplish the purposes of God in the strength of the flesh. And you see, the thing about spiritual power is that if it is there, it is there. If it is not there, it is not there. There is no hoping, wishing. You can know that it has come. He says, such as I have. You can know you have it. We see the rain of your love. We see the wind of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven let us hear. We see the rain of your love. We feel the wind of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven let us hear. So let it rain. 